Welcome to the Hockey Podcast. I am Luke Lipinski. And I'm Doug Cannon. On this week's show, we try not to interfere with Hendrik Lundqvist, and we teach Sam Bennett how to do a pull-up. And we'll also take some time to look at a Twitter ICYMI item regarding off-season trades. That was very hip and savvy. All that plus an NHL Awards preview. Let's drop the puck on episode 43. Doug, how you doing? Luke, I'm doing very well, thank you. We are recording this, I don't know what time it is, but it's it after. It is actually 9.06 Mountain Standard Time. So it's actually tomorrow on the East Coast. On 6.9. And if you're in the East Coast, somehow listening it is to now this live. It's now 6.10. Yes. <laughs> well, Look, if you're the Rangers, you're happy to turn the page on 6-9 because... Yes, it wasn't a very good day. Before we get to that, though, of course, we have to get to the number game. To the number game. Here we go. Rapidly taking over the country as we speak. Number 43, as this is episode 43. Doug, who you got? Who have I got? Let me go to the notes. Never good when you have to go to the notes for the best player at one particular... Martin Baron. He's doing a lot of... uh, analysis for the NHL network right now. Yes, he is. He and but that's Dan my Bilesma. 40, that's my 43. Okay. Yeah, I feel bad about Dan Bilesma. Well, we'll get to him. He's doing. He, he got a job. It took him about three days, and now he's doing NHL, and I'm sure we'll have another job soon enough. I knew you were going to go Biron. How did you know I was going to go I know how you think. So I'm going to go with a current What was player. his original number as a rookie nah, before I'm, he wore 43? Mm, zero. Very good. Zero, zero. God, you doubt my hockey knowledge? Come on. This is all I know. I'll go... Valerie Nachushkin, because I'm, I'm wow. looking into the future. I think wow. he's going to be good. The other option currently was Nazem Kadri, but I'm, I'm, uh, I don't even know what come team on, Kadri's a good player. I think I think he is, but I know them doing he's this not way up there with a Toronto person, and Toronto seems to be down on Nazem Kadri right now. Don Cherry's not down on him, of course not. Plays for Toronto. My f- my backup was uh, Philippe Boucher. Well, that's you just like saying the French names. Yes, it's, I do. Baton Rouge. It's very Philippe clear. Boucher. Any excuse? Comment ça va? Any ça va bien? Et toi? <laughs> used to break out that horrible excuse for a French accent you have over there. All right, hockey podcast, iTunes, tune in, YouTube, SoundCloud, Podbean, Podbean. I should probably get that memorized in my head. The LA Kings. You forgot the hockey podcast at gmail dot com. It's true. You should be emailing us. Oh, and Twitter. And Twitter. And the website that I forgot the uh, <laughs> the domain name to my own website. But WordPress. There's, there's a lot of amazing pictures up there. Yeah, the hockey pro- podcast at WordPress.com. Yeah. Yeah. Might even put a mock draft up there. Possibly before the real draft. That would make it a mock. Yeah. Or, or, or I could do it afterwards and just mock the actual draft. Oh, See that? Very good. That's more, that's more up my alley. All right. Kings are up 3 nothing. This uh, series has suddenly become very anticlimactic. I mean, what a downer tonight after double overtime the game before. And overtime in game one. And overtime in game one. So I was talking to somebody today, and they said, well, it looks like New York's done. I said, well, how can you say that? It's only 2-0. And theoretically, when you play at home, you're supposed to win. L.A. did that. L.A. was at home, had to go to overtime in both games, but they left L.A. 2-0. So now you're in New York. Theoretically, New York should win both games, go back to L.A., right? Yeah, no. Not happening. No. I think Wednesday will be kaput. Whoever you spoke to was a genius. Um, I think going into this series. Do I have to admit that? Yeah, because you don't have to say his or her name. And it wasn't me, so I don't really care if they get any credit at all. Okay, that's good. Because it was my wife. Oh, well, she's a genius. <laughs> she's don't say that too loud, dude. She might hear you. Well, she's obviously picked up a lot of hockey from, I can only assume, from listening to this podcast. Dude, do we do anything but hockey in this house? No. Okay. No, you, you do not. This is a house of hockey, that's for sure. So I'm looking at this series, and you know, coming into this series – Everybody that I talked to, and certainly myself included, I thought L.A. would win in six. And my thinking was L.A. is far superior to New York. They just – I'm sorry. They just are. The, the, not the city, but on, the actual on teams. On many levels. And we broke it down last week. We yes, had we better did. offense, better defense, and I thought the Rangers had the edge in net, but if, it's negligible. Physicality, I think. Coaching, I think even. And I like Vigneault. Special teams. They have, I mean, they have the advan- home ice advantage. <laughs> Suter has his team – playing like a machine and they are playing for him you know it's you hear an interview with Suter or Sutter and and, and you get you know he's he's not the most 
he, he's kind of like Greg Popovich from the NBA. Like he clearly doesn't like doing the the press conferences and the interviews or whatever. And yet, whatever he says in that locker room, I mean, you got to put him up there as one of the best coaches in the NHL. He's going to have won two Stanley Cups in three years. Right. So, before we started recording, I, I looked at tonight's stats. And the right. biggest stat that just, like, popped out at me right away was shots on goal. New York outshot L.A. 32-15. to 15, But in watching the game... I didn't feel that. Didn't feel that way at all. Didn't feel that way at all. Uh, am I wrong? No, I completely agree with you. And we didn't watch the game together. Final score was three nothing. And if you just look at the the box score and you give me those numbers and you say L.A. is winning that game, where New York at least in theory is doing a lot of things right, right, then New York is screwed. Right. Because back to my original point, I think you said L.A. in 6-2. I think a lot of people thought L.A. was going to win. They are the superior team. They just went through Chicago. They've had to rally in all these series. Now they're up. I think for New York to have any chance, they had to steal game one because L.A. might have had a little bit of an emotional letdown coming off of the Chicago game. And L.A. is And fine. tired. Yeah. And L.A. doesn't see, LA doesn't get rattled if they lose game one. So there could have been a chance to sneak in. Rangers had it. Had a two-goal lead. Blew it. Game two had a two-goal lead. Blew it. That's Twice. it. Twice. That, I mean, that's game over. Right. What are you you going to keep giving L.A. second and third chances? Well, and then tonight, the other stat that I think is more telling is power play. New York's power play, non-existent. L.A. gave it to them on a platter. They had six power plays, cashed in on zero. Yeah, and that was when the Rangers were down 3-1 to Pittsburgh. The power play wasn't clicking. It wasn't clicking when they played Philadelphia, but they were still winning because they were scoring, you know, even strength goals. And they got the power play going against Pittsburgh. But if, you know, if that's not there, L.A. continues to score on the power play. They had another one tonight. It's just, I mean, they're beating them in every facet of the game. Now, tonight, I just, I feel, and I don't want it to be this way. I love seeing a seven-game Stanley Cup. We haven't had a sweep since Detroit beat Washington back in, what was that, 98? I mean, that's the last time we had a, I don't want to say a bad Stanley Cup, because the first two games of this Cup were great, but we know who's going to win the Stanley Cup now. But I said it before we started recording, you know, the moon and the sun and the stars all seem to have aligned, A, for the National Hockey League. You got a New York, L.A. series, coast, East Coast versus West Coast. The networks are salivating. I got the biggest... Television market on the East Coast. I got the biggest television market on the West Coast. Um, and you've got a dud of a series right now. I was just going to ask you, is this a dud? And I guess you just answered my question because you used the exact word I was going to use. I'm just looking back the last couple of years, 4-2 Chicago over Boston, although Boston was 17 seconds away from going to Game 7. Kings over Devils was 4-2. You know, Bruins, Canucks obviously was 4-3. That's great. We got a lot of 6-7 game sets all the way back to, like I said, Detroit over Washington in 98. But what's weird is the three Stanley Cups before that were all sweeps too. So there was a stretch in the mid-90s where – once you got to the Stanley Cup, that was it was kind of an afterthought. Well, it's almost a letdown after watching the Western Conference Final. That was the Stanley Cup, and we knew it as we watched it. And now we've got this in front of us, and I'm like, home. Oh. Like, I even found myself leaving the game and going and watching other programming. Ooh, I'm not there yet. And then came back to the game. I can't do that because now I know I only probably have 60 and minutes I, of NHL hockey. And I'm not, I'm not saying I did it during play-by-play, but as soon as there was a break in action... I check another channel. Yeah, and it didn't matter what it was. I would just go away, and then I would come back. And there was points where I was like, "I'm about to turn this off." Yeah, tonight's game just never felt like it was in doubt. It's completely different when LA is up two nothing as opposed to when New York's up two nothing. Well, like when LA jumps up for one nothing, and then you know New York goes on the power play. We we just talked about the power play, and nothing happens. And I'm like, "This is your opportunity. All you got to do is win this game, and you're back in the series." Oh yeah. Because, again, the first game went overtime, the second game went double overtime. And you led – L.A. hadn't led a game until tonight. I mean, they, they right. won those games in overtime, but they never led in those games. So let me, let me ask you this. And another thing real quick is that L.A. has proven through the playoffs that winning on road – winning on the road is not a problem for this club. Nothing is a problem for no. them. I mean, I said this last week. I'm extremely impressed by this team. They – I'm not a Kings fan, but no. they deserve to win the Stanley Cup this year. Right now, yeah, I they, can't disagree. They came back 
from down 3 nothing against the San Jose team that seemed to have figured it out. And mm-hmm. then, I mean, they were down 3 nothing and they came back and won. Nothing's going to rattle them. Being down 2 nothing in a game against New York is not going to rattle them. They came back and beat Chicago in Chicago. They were down 3-2 to Anaheim. I think that was the best chance for them to lose. What did Dustin Brown call a team? Uh, zombie hockey? Zombies? Because they just keep coming and yeah. coming and coming and coming. And I wonder, was it Mike Richards after the... Chicago series. Martinez. Martinez. Oh, Martinez. Alec Martinez. Alec Martinez. Yeah. Martinez. And we talked about their defense last week. You know, they. it's not just Drew Doughty. It's Voinov. It's, it's okay. Martinez. On, it's on that point. Muzzin. On that point. Yes. Another stat in tonight's game three. L.A. had 20 block shots. New York had 11. Of L.A.'s 20, uh, three, seven, eight. Are these lottery numbers? Yeah. Okay. Make sure you write them down. I'm writing them on my own forehead. 11, 13. 13 of the 20 were from the defense. Okay. I believe Which it. it should be. And they seem timely. The other thing I pointed out to you before earlier was that every single player that played 20 minutes or more in tonight's game for L.A. was a defenseman. Which meant the forwards... We're only putting in 15, 16, 17 minutes. So that means all your firepower is rested. Yeah, for Wednesday when they can go close out the series in New York. And I don't think New York has a huge home ice advantage because there's so much pressure on them. You know, I agree. And now, now there's disappointment from their fans. Right. Because I think mainly tonight, I, we'd have to get a, a Rangers fan on here, and that could be dangerous because, well, I guess there's, but there's think no about delay. It. It's think not about live. It. Madison Square Gardens, they started heavy on the road right at the beginning of the season because they renovated Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden is an iconic arena in North America, uh, if not in the, in the world. Everybody, talk, everybody You say Madison Square Gardens, most people everybody know what you're talking about, right? Huge renovation. They finally get back to the cup in their brand new spanky clean building. 20 years, right? Big right. 20-ish, 19, 20 years. And... Yeah, I mean, not not only do you lose, you get shut out. I this I Kings feel team, really bad for Rangers fans right now. I don't. This Kings team, <laughs> I just I don't. I had to hear from so many of them two weeks ago. This Kings team, in my mind, destroys the 2012 Kings. I don't even think it's close. If they play a game somehow, I don't know how that would work when Dustin Brown ran into Dustin Brown and they both fell down. This team is better than the 2012 That's scary. team. Well, yeah, and I don't even think it's close. Oh. I mean, the 2012 team, give them credit. They won the Stanley Cup. I think a lot of things went their way that year on the ice and also just in the other series. You know, to play New Jersey when they could have played Pittsburgh or Boston or even New York then. But a lot of things went their way, and they were so dependent on Quick to stand on his head, which he did. This year, they can beat you 10 different ways. But, uh, you know, we touched, on, t- tussed. we touched on it last week with the pickup of Carter, the pickup of Gabrick. Huge, huge, huge to the chemistry of this team. Add to Foley and Pearson this year. From the AHL. Give up nothing. And you gave up nothing. Nothing. Didn't really give up that much for Gabrick. I know you gave up picks and you gave up Two Matt picks Fratton, and Fratton. But it's not like they were top 10 first round picks. And you don't need those picks because you just had to Foley and Pearson come up. And all your defense is set. Oh, You know, we'll look at it maybe later in a, in a different show. To As we get closer to free agency, we'll look at some of the big names that, that might be changing teams this summer. But uh, they can keep most of this team together. And I remember when they won in 2012 – thinking there's no way that team gets back to the Cup next year, which was last year, and they didn't. But this year, I wouldn't be shocked at all if they were back there next year. That's a good hockey team. You know, and there's this guy called Danny uh, Carcillo had his uh, suspension reduced, and yeah. I don't think he's going to see the ice. The, the secret weapon? That's not That wasn't New York's plan, go down 3 yeah. nothing and then bring Dan Carcillo back? This is the point. I he went, can't, right? He can't come back till Game 7. No, he can get back to Game 4. Oh, he can't come yeah. back. Okay. So now he's in there for the four straight <clears throat> Rangers wins. I don't know who's going to be the Conn Smythe winner. It seems like it might be Drew Doughty, Justin Williams, or Marion Gabrick. But the point I wanted to make... Uh, I'd go 77. Last week, yeah, he's right there, too. And Kopitar leads everybody. Kopitar. Justin Williams, I know the stat's old, but we didn't get to it last week. 14 points in Game 7s in his career. You know where that ranks all time? Mm -mm. Number one. Wow. Number one ahead of Doug Gilmore, Wayne Gretzky. Ahead of Wayne Gretzky. That's a stat to hold on to. And it's not a fluke. He's clutch. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He was third star tonight. And he scored the uh, overtime game winner in game one, too, just to kind of drive that point home. I do want to ask you, though, about game two. I don't want to make excuse for the Rangers, but the third L.A. goal, you know where I'm going with this, where Lundquist was basically being laid on top of by Dwight King? 
They mm-hmm. were not happy. And I don't think it should have been a penalty, but I do think L.A. kind of got away with one there, and that changed that whole game. And I still think L.A. wins the series, but that was that was brutal. It's funny you bring it up because I saw, in in my opinion and what I was watching, I saw a lot of that tonight on a smaller scale where I thought a lot of non-calls were going in L.A.'s favor. And I'm not an L.A. fan, and I'm not an L.A. homer. I mean, I saw two or three interference calls that weren't called. I saw um, an offside that wasn't called. There were, now, these aren't big calls, but, but they those they're momentum swingers, depending on when it's called. And I just think right now L.A. has got so much momentum behind them. It, it, everything's just rolling on. in their favor, and it's all rolling in their direction. You know, and it's well deserved. They fought and clawed and battled, and they're they're where they're at. They did, but I wonder if we're going to see some sort of change in the off season. There's talk that they might give them coaches challenges for for next season, or that's at least going to be discussed. Because I just I, I didn't watch game two live. I didn't watch regulation. I saw overtime because mm-hmm. I was because I was playing hockey, so I have a good excuse. But I went back and rewatched the game. And look, LA scored. They were down four two when they scored that goal. They've scored six straight goals now. New York hasn't scored since, and that goal shouldn't have counted. Okay, so they scored five straight goals. Yeah, but, I mean, if they don't get that goal, they don't win game two. True. So, I don't know. I mean, again, I don't think it would have uh, impacted the overall outcome of the series. We may have just seen more games. LA is still going to win. But it's interesting <laughs> to see what happens next. Well, I brought up the calls because I'm a little sensitive. I'm sensitive to the delay of game call. We've discussed that to end on the show. Well, and you hate officials, but go ahead. And then <laughs> I've also, interference is such a, a wishy-washy call. I mean, it's like, Either the guy's being denied access to the puck or he's not. To me, it's clear cut. The other one that tonight that upset me was an icing call. Wow. And it was the new icing oh, the, call. the touch-up icing, hybrid icing. And it was so wrong. Fortunately, tonight it didn't have an impact on the final score. No, we didn't have an impact on the final score. But I, I, the only reason I, I bring it up again is that I think that L.A. just has so much in their favor right now that it's a hard, hard hill for New York to climb. And I'm sorry, Henrik can stand on his head all he wants. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If, if this was flipped and New York was up 3 nothing, would you think the series was over? Because I wouldn't. I'd still think L.A. could come back and win it. I watched uh, Lundqvist look at the scoreboard after the first goal tonight. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the shot. And you could tell by the look on his face, he almost looked dejected. Because he got a piece of it, and it was deflected. With a second left in the first period, too. Right. But that's the heartening part about it, right? I mean, the players were watching. uh, The New York Rangers players were leaving the ice at the end of the first period, and fans were like, leaning over, give me a high five. Hey, hey, give me a high five. Uh, Dude, did you just watch the game? There's 0.7 seconds left on the board, and they just scored. And it went off Dan Girardi, who hasn't had a great series. He's a good player, but nothing has gone his way this series. Right, and we're like, we're not very happy. We're not going to give many high fives right now. No, no. And you're – yeah, that that, that was brutal. It's funny, too, because right after that, they showed the – I think it's an Advil commercial where Lundquist (laughs) stops the rhino. Have you seen that? Yes. Because they've only shown it 19,000 times. He stops the rhino. It turns into like 30,000 pucks, and none of them go in the net. If that rhino had redirected off Dan Girardi, it would have gone into the net. And then the net would have been full of pucks. Yeah, and that's not what you want to see, but it is what we are now seeing. You're tuned in to The Hockey Podcast. Follow us on Twitter, at Hockey Podcast, for even more hockey news. Hashtag do it. Segment two. That Doug. follows one, right? Well, it, it follows the best. We have to release. It's before three. Sometimes. Okay. Depending, depending how you edit the show. We have to, one of these days, release the the outtakes that are airing i guess they're not airing between segments one and two and two and three because that's the best i know i would have to record them for that to happen that's thank true. god the last exchange did not get recorded somebody's always recording everything though i know big brother's yeah. always watching it's probably on the internet we, we should go listen to it <laughs> all right so the nhl awards are june 24th so two, two weeks. weeks and they'll be in las vegas i will be there i'll make this promise to you right now I've already made it to you, but I'll make it again on the air. We will have audio from the NHL Awards nice. on that podcast following June 24th from the players. Not just audio of me going, hey, I'm lost You're in the You're not going to get uh, audio from the uh, valet? I should. I should be like, hey, where'd you park my <laughs> Where's car? Where's my car, dude? <laughs> <laughs> Only that would make a good movie. It would. That's Yeah, and they could call it like 
where's my car, dude? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, only if Zeno Chara is the valet. We'll, we'll have audio from all the guys that are there. So while we're here right now, Doug, we don't have any more Stanley Cup to talk about. What about front office guys? You going to get any front office guys? Maybe I'll get the Jack Adams winner and the GM of the year. Speaking of the Jack Adams and the GM of the year. What? What an amazing transition. We have three candidates. GM of the year. We have Mr. Lombardi, whose team is still in the Stanley Cup final. But that does not that's not supposed to count. I understand that. Mr. Bob Murray in Anaheim. And we have... Um, ooh. No, you get to do the French accent. I, uh, Marc Bergevin. Marc Bergevin. So, this is how this is going to work. We're going to throw out the finalists. You and I are each going to make a pick. You're probably not going to write them down because I'm going to get all nine of these right. Okay. So, maybe I'll write them down on this pad of paper. Go ahead. I'm not going to because it's your pad of paper. That'd be rude. I put it there for a reason. But not for me to write to on. To write on. Who's your pick? Lombardi. I'm going to go Bergevin. Wow. You've become a Montreal Canadian fan. That's not true at all. I think Lombardi is the best of these three in general. I mean, his team's but he's not going to win. Well, because well, that's good logic. I think so. <laughs> Follow me here down the, the now down a logical lane. It's supposed to be the regular season award. Okay. L.A. was very good three years ago, very good two years ago, very good this year. 100 points. Montreal was awful a couple years ago. They had 100 points this year. Identical records. Bergevin's only been there for is this first year. That's pretty solid. I'm giving it to him. I like your logic. I'm still going with Lombardi. Of course, last year's winner is out of a job, but we'll get to that later on in the show, too. Jack Adams. Jack Adams. Patrick Waugh. Mm-hmm. John Cooper. Mike Babcock. Patrick Waugh. Yeah, I think it's got Period. to be Waugh, right? Period. I think that Cooper did an excellent job. I don't job even understand why Mike Bay. Babcock's names are. Well... Let me play devil's advocate again. I've noticed I do this Good a lot luck. in this podcast. All of his players were hurt. He got them into the playoffs. <laughs> You're tearing up over there, I can see. Uh, I think at this point, really, if you look at it, they were they were just looking for two names to fill out to watch closely as Patrick Waugh wins. How can you argue Patrick Waugh? He's going to win. He has to. You know what's interesting? First year... Oh yeah, no. There's we're not even debating. Yeah, okay. first year and and he they win the division and they had not only the division they win the toughest division and they had the first pick in the draft last year. That's how bad they were a season ago. GM of the year and, and the Jack Adams are kind of strange because I feel like we'll get to these other ones in a second. You get to like the Hart Trophy. These are kind of the three best players in the NHL for the most part. And Norris Trophy is pretty much three best defensemen. Jack Adams, those aren't the three best coaches in the NHL. They just won I this disagree. Year. You think those are the three best coaches? No, I agree with oh, you. Okay. But, but, I mean, they're not supposed to be. They're just supposed to be from this year. So, I, I'm not saying that, like, the system. Well, I think there's long. other coaches that had stronger regular seasons than those. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Care you to disagree? Elaborate? I didn't think of it that way. I wasn't trying to. Because, I mean, if you're going to base everything on the regular season, there's other coaches out there. What about Quinville? Well, yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. You could have Quenville and you could have Claude Julien in there. What about year. Yo? Yeah. I still think Wa would have won. Lindy Ruff. Look what Lindy Ruff did in Dallas. Yeah, I mean, 15 years in Buffalo comes over, takes Dallas to the playoffs in his first year. Yeah. yeah. It's still going to go to Wa. I think ultimately the guy who deserves it the most is going to win it this year. Right. Norris Trophy. Norris. This is your trophy. This is my ever, trophy. This is my favorite position. If you're ever to steal there a trophy, is, there, this is, one. there is no question in my mind. There's only one person. No, we're going down this path again. Okay. okay. I have stats to back my pickup, but go ahead since you're so, so certain. The nominees are Chara, Keith, and Weber. I feel Top like. Top three defensemen I, in the I league, yes like, or no? I feel like the, that, those names could have been read with What's, more gusto. There's one missing, though. That I think should be here. There's a few missing. Right. I mean, Eric Carlson is the most exciting Absolutely. defensive player. But it was plus P.K. minus. P.K. Subban. Like minus yeah, why isn't P.K. Subban on this list? That's who's missing. Is Like, where's P.K.? This guy gets zero respect. You and I have talked about him since day one. That this this player gets zero respect. He's He's the franchise. And we'll get to it later in the show. 
but there's trade rumors. Yeah, well, I'm like, are uh... you kidding me? <laughs> well, he won the Norris Trophy last year, so he at least got some respect in that regard. I'm guessing... What, you can't win it two years in a row? No, I'm not saying that, but I'm guessing he's on the cover of NHL 15 next year. Does that help at all? Uh, smooths it out a little bit. But... It's going to be that shot of him celebrating against Boston, too. That's got to be the cover, right? Duncan Keith is my pick. Yeah, I'm. I think Chara is the best of these players, but Duncan Keith had the best year. I don't. I think Duncan Keith is way better than Chara. At, well, you love Duncan that, Keith at, at that position. I yeah. think positionally, watching watching Keith in that series against L.A. That doesn't count for this. I understand. Okay, but he showed the talent that he has as a defenseman. It pains me to pick Duncan Keith because I knew you would take Duncan Keith, and <laughs> I don't want to have to sit here and say good things about him right in front of you, but. The the three finalists, Shea Weber had 56 points, and he was a minus two on the year. Chara had 40 points. He was a plus 25. I know it's not all about points with defensemen, a plus minus is flawed, but Duncan Keith, 61 points, a plus 22, and an anchor to that defense. Ding, 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 ding. It's got to be him. It's him. And I think it will be him. It will be him. All right, so now it's You heard it first here. Out. Well, probably not first and probably not last. Well, seeing as how we're at the back, en- the back end of the rink, let's go to the Vesna. That's kind of our motto for the show, isn't it? You What's probably it? didn't hear it first, and you probably won't hear it here last. <laughs> All right, so the Vesna Trophy, the nominees are... Mama always said... I don't like where this is going. It's better to be last and correct than to be first and wrong. See, I always thought Mama said knock you out. But that was from... Have you heard the remake? I have not. Oh, you have to hear the remake by Five Finger Death Punch. (laughs) It's phenomenal. That's a Disney band? Yeah. Okay, it's good. The nominees are? The nominees of the Vesna are? Ben Bishop, Bishop. Tampa Bay Lightning. Yes. Semyon Varlamov, Colorado Avalanche, Tuka Rask, Boston Bruins. Doug, your pick. Despite his run-in with the law, I go Varlamov. Mm, Okay. I'm going to go Tuka Rask. 2.04. 2.04. Because that's just too easy. Goals against average. Well, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here. I'm not trying to reinvent the Finnish goaltender. 930 save percentage. I mean, look, Varlamov was right there. And Ben Bishop had a phenomenal year. I think it's cool that Ben Bishop got nominated. He wasn't even on Tampa Bay season. two years ago. Yeah. But, I mean, they could have easily just said Carey Price, who actually now I look at it probably deserved to be there. But uh, I, I think Rask. Rask. I Rask think you're wrong. Yeah. I think Varlamov wins it. I'm gonna have. We are gonna write these down. I'm gonna go back and listen to this. Okay. I, what I understand, you can listen to podcasts, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make some notes. All right. All right. You throw out the category. Okay. Let's go to. It's like Jeopardy. Lady Bing. Oh. Here we go. Lady Bing. The nominees are Monsieur Marlowe. I didn't know that was his first name. Uh, Mister St. Louis. That, that's good. Make sure you keep the, the French accent for Marlowe, but not for St. Louis. Martin St. Louis. And O'Reilly. All right. Ryan, well, Ryan O'Reilly. You made the pick before I could make the pick. Ryan O'Reilly, 64 points, No, I was just minutes. saying his first name. Oh. Well, 64 but points, But that's my pick. Two penalty minutes. That's, <laughs> that, that's a no-brainer. I, I feel like that's pretty much a lot. Doesn't it seem like a lot of these are more clear-cut? And I say that now, and then in three weeks, we're going to be wrong on all of them. And right. I'm like a moron. But right now, you don't know that I'm a moron. So I'm going to say, it seems like they're pretty clear cut so far. O'Reilly had zero PIMS in how many games? 78? It, it something was, like that? Yeah, I mean, he got, the, he got the penalty for playing with a broken stick or holding on to the broken stick for yeah, a Yeah, it wasn't even like an infraction against another player. No. It was it's like, oh, look, I'm skating with a stick that's broken. You're in the penalty box. But, I mean, you could find any fool with just two penalty minutes. There's not a lot of them. But the fact that you couple that with 64 points. I mean, right. He had a good season, he too. Had a solid season. He did it without hitting anybody or whatever. Hitting nothing anybody against illegally. Martin St. Louis, but I, I think uh, O'Reilly's the, yeah. the guy. And Patrick Marlowe, he's there. He's a good player. As somebody once pointed out, he has uh, kind eyebrows. That's why he's one of the finalists. I read that somewhere. Wow. <laughs> and, and you can't argue with it because... You know, well, you don't really don't want to go there. I guess not. That's a kind of a TMI thing. I'm going to throw out the next category, and I'm going to go with the Selkie. The nominees are Patrice Bergeron, Boston Bruins. Yeah, whatever. You got like a Godfather thing going on over there. Yeah. Everything okay? Anze Kopitar, LA Kings. Jonathan Taves, Chicago Blackhawks. My pick is Anze Kopitar. All of these guys. I feel like these are going to be the three finalists for this particular award for the next five years. Why do you pick Kopitar? 
this is where I'm kind of going against the rules. Kopitar has been so amazing in these playoffs. And that's well, kind of... Wait a minute. It's a regular season. Does it count? <laughs> it's kind of stirred up in me the thought that he's kind of underrated. On yeah, a I'll agree scale. with the fact that scale. he's underrated. And so I feel like we should give him an award because he's underrated. And I came from the generation <laughs> where you get participation oh, awards. Oh, my goodness. And I mean, Jonathan Taves wins everything except, you know, Western Conference Finals against L.A. And Patrice Bergeron, he should get something for playing last year's Stanley Cup with a punctured lung. Uh, but I'm giving it to Kopitar. I'm going Bergeron. All right. I think. Be that way. He's more defensive. And he has a French-sounding name, so naturally. He's Bergeron. Naturally, he would take it. Yes. All right, your turn. Not bad for an Ontario boy, huh? No, no, no. Well, not good either, but go ahead. Okay, so... uh Let's go for uh, Mr. Eleven here. Mark Messier, Leadership Award. Your voice has changed like nine times in this segment. <laughs> we have uh, Mr. Brown, Mr. Taves, and Mr. Getzloff. I'm going Jonathan Taves. I'd have to agree. I don't necessarily agree with the narrative that he's instantly the best captain in the NHL. I don't. I think some of that's because he plays for Chicago, and Chicago fans are loud, and so it gets tossed his way. However... He's one of the best. And this isn't just on you know, ice. We, we talked about this last week. You have to realize the amount of pressure his team was under this season being defending champ. And he's got to keep the room going. He's got to keep everybody on the bench going. And he's got to stay up and positive himself. And he's got to produce himself. Too. And then he's got to produce himself. And so that's kind of why I voted for Taves. Getzlaff put up more points than either of these guys. Dustin Brown kind of had a down year statistically, but he's going to win the Stanley but Cup. But you know what? I get so frustrated when everybody turns to the stat page. Because a leadership award to me is not based on stats. But you can't lead with no stats. Like, yes, I you can. So you're, you're telling me I could go lead the Anaheim Ducks just because I'm a good Robert leader? Robert Luongo was captain. That was Vancouver. Anything goes up there. It should be I noted. I don't think that you need to have 50 goals to be a captain. No, but you gotta. You have to do something. You can't just be like, hey, go out there and do that because I can't. No, 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 no. I think that, yes, you have to be a competent player, but... I think leadership goes far beyond points. Well, it's funny you put it that way because this particular award goes beyond any production on the ice. This is also in the community, too. So just worth noting, all these guys did something in the community. We're not going to go through each of them right here. but We're not going to list their charities? I don't have them right here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, I'm my, I get to pick next category. Okay, you're pick. Not, you're, you're messing this up. There's only one left. I know, but I'm going to do a good job. Oh, no. No, there's two left. Calder Trophy, Rookie of the Year. Nominees are Tyler Johnson of the Tampa Bay Lightning. Had a pretty good year. Yes, he did. Maybe you want to vote for him. Andre Palat, who I believe just resigned with Tampa Bay today. Uh, he had a really good year, too. Nice to have two Rookie of the Year finalists and then Nathan McKinnon. Yeah, I was going to say big deal. So, yeah, I mean. <laughs> you know, Colorado is actually going to come out uh, smelling like roses in this award show on well, the 24th. They should. I mean, this is a regular Nathan season Nathan McKinnon award show and- clearly is going to win the Calder. You know, if uh, I'm willing to give you Tyler Johnson and Andre Palat, and I'll just take McKinnon. You get two names out of this one. No, I'm picking Nathan McKinnon right. because that's who's going to win. Fair enough. Is there any more categories? I feel like there's one more. Yeah. Go ahead. The one that we're going to argue the most over. You think we're going to argue over this? this well, I don't think we're going to argue. We're going to have a very good conversation. Right All right. Again. I can eliminate one right off the top so of that. So right now we're going to discuss the Hart Trophy. And we have Mr. Sidney Crosby, uh, Mr. Ryan Getzloff, and Mr. Claude Giroux. Okay, we can take Giroux out because he didn't show up for the first month of the season. So, out. Most valuable player has to show up all year. But did Claude Giroux get his team to the playoffs? He did, and he had 86 points, which is impressive since he didn't show up for the first month of the season. Claude Giroux deserves to be a finalist, but does not deserve to win. Okay. Was that your pick? No. No. All right. Well, who's your pick? I'm going with Getzlaff. All right. Let me remind you, this is a regular season award, and that's when the Penguins do their best work. you got to go Crosby. 17 more points. More than Getzlaff. Getzlaff had 87. Crosby had 104. They're both really good players. I just, again, I get so organic when I feel these things, and 
I feel that Getzlav was more of an asset to his team than Crosby was. So if you were Anaheim this year and the Penguins said, we'll give you Sidney Crosby for Ryan Getzlav, you wouldn't do it? No. Can you do the rest of the show without me? Can I take the headphones with me? Can I just go sit in a different room? Why Why is that hard to believe that I would not do that trade? Because Crosby's the best player in the world. Don't make me say this. He's the best player in the world. But this year's playoffs notwithstanding. <laughs> he's flat, dude. He's just, he's not the same dude. He's not, he doesn't seem like he's the same guy he was before he got hurt a couple years ago. I'll give you that. He's just not the same Sid. But he still put up 104 points. I understand that. And he's got a lot of inconsistent very talented players around him, but inconsistent. I will give you that Getzlaff doesn't have but a talent around him. But what is the Hart Award? Most valuable player. To who? I mean, you want to get philosophical? But I think to that Getzlaff was more valuable to his team. Well, is it to the team or to the league? Because Crosby's the face of the league. I don't want to go down that path because then you can make a it's case he deserves league. every year. Crosby's that would be the it. marketing tool award. I don't know Not the I, heart. I don't know if I ever want to get the Tool Award. <laughs> Sidney Crosby hasn't won the MVP since 2007. You would think he's won it a few times. He's won it once, ever. I and rest my case. Thank you for the ammo. That, no, he deserves <laughs> to win it. He should have won more than one. Ovechkin's won three. What has he done? Just score 55 goals a year? Yeah, I have a problem with that, too. Yeah, I don't, you're going to lose me on this one. I, 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 I'm a big Getzlaff guy. I think that he had... You're right. I mean, if he doesn't have the year he has, they lost Bobby Ryan. They're not in the playoffs, period. No, they're a playoff team, but they're not. Not with maybe the goaltending. Maybe not in the West. No. no. Wow, do you think he's worth that many points in the standings? He might be on that team. He might be. Yeah. Okay, so it's decided. Sidney Crosby to, wins. I'm, I'm going with my organic choice, and it's gets locked. Okay, well, Crosby's going to win, so I'll just go ahead and mark that it's one. It just kind of flows with the California vibe. Yeah, you just took a bunch of guys from California, and half these guys aren't even in the award show. You're sitting there voting on Marcel Dion. That's You can't do that. I don't know what's going on over there. You're listening to The Hockey Podcast. Feel free to email comments or questions to the show at our email address, thehockeypodcast at gmail.com. Final segment, news and notes. Doug, this is your favorite segment. And it's segment three because it follows segment two. See, we're starting to piece this together. Yeah, it only took there. We're getting 43 there. episodes, which I believe. Yes, I love news and notes. 43 comes after 42. So let's start with the Calder Cup because you've been talking about it so much lately. How'd the uh, Toronto Marlies do? I don't know. I didn't know the Calder Cup was still going on. Well, it's, <laughs> it is for two teams. I know it is. <laughs> not not for your team. They're in the they're in the Calder Cup final. Um, the Marlies lost to the Texas Stars four three. That's the series. And then um, your boys over in uh, PA uh, I'm folded not, too. Not here to talk about the past. Okay, I'm here to talk about the present. And the present is Wilkes Bar Penguins. They uh they lost to St. John's. They might lose their coach to Pittsburgh too. We'll get to that. Oh, okay. Dallas is uh is not in this. It's the Texas Stars, but their logo looks exactly the same. St. John's Ice Caps, Texas Stars, one one. That's the series Af- now. after two after games. Tonight, yeah. So there you go. Thanks. Boy, you're just all over the counting. We somebody watched Sesame Street today. <laughs> So that's it, it. Bring up Toronto just because they swept their first round series, they swept their second round series, and then they got yeah. We were both pretty round. high on them when the the, the tournament started. Well, that, you know, holy cow! You know this team's undefeated. They ran into the Texas Stars, and it all changed. Well, and they're holding a lot of people up because I think a lot of teams that are left and I just still think it's funny that Toronto's in the Western Conference. Yeah, that's a little weird. A lot of NHL teams that are looking for a coach, and there are still. Well, now there's three. Now, now there's four. Uh, Willie Desjardins is is one of the guys that his name's at least being thrown around, and he's still coaching in the Calder Cup, so nobody can talk to him. Well, they can talk to him. Well, not they can hockey. say, hi, Willie, how's it going? And that's Want a it. cup of coffee? No, can't offer him coffee. That's wrong. Okay. So that's the uh, Calder Cup. But we go to the uh, the new coaching vacancy. Yes. What's that team? Um they were in the playoffs, and now they're not in the playoffs. Now, now they're not. That's that's very astute and and true. Well, the Penguins. All this. And talk, they thought they were going to have a Hart nominee win, but they will have that. That's going to be okay. the one thing they okay. have. That's all they're going to have to show for this season. So Ray Shiro wins GM of the year last year, widely regarded as one of the best. He's out. Yeah, that's amazing because 
I texted you out of just a fit of anger when it happened. He's out because Henrik Lundqvist played three very good games in a row, and so Pittsburgh got rid of one of the three or four best GMs in the NHL. I would agree with that statement. So then, that's not news. They hire Jim Rutherford, which is news. Correct. This, he was this longtime week. GM of Carolina, right. Hartford. He comes in and within, what, about five minutes, fires Dan Bilesma. Yeah, I was really shocked by that. I was just shocked by the order it went down in just the timeline. If you're going to fire Dan Bilesma, if you're the Pittsburgh Penguins and your expectation really is to be a cup contender every year, if you're going to make the coaching change, don't you want to make it when Barry Trotz is still out there? Well, here's the funny thing for me, though. I mean, we had discussed it. And then when Pittsburgh was knocked out, I had actually said very glibly that I bet you Shiro and Bilesma are both gone. I did say that. They won three playoff series in the last two years. I get it. And then um, Shiro was gone and Coach wasn't. And we go, hmm, okay. I guess you can live with that. And we're now two weeks or so away from the draft and you let your head coach go. I I don't get the progression there. And the reason I say that is we've been following the co- the head coach situation right now, the vacancies. There are not a lot of strong candidate names floating around. No, there really aren't. And, and the only names that are coming up are old recycled names. Or completely unproven. Right. And I don't think... Now, if you're Carolina... I was going to say, Carolina can, can try can something. You can do that. I, I mean, we talked if about you're this last Pittsburgh, week. Old Samuelson's you... a great fit for Carolina. I think so. And and it seems like that's what they're going to do because they're waiting and waiting, and I can only imagine it's because they're still in the Stanley Cup for two more days probably, maybe four more days. But, you know, in Florida we talked about how they could they could almost go with a really established guy to try and whip those youngsters in shape, or they can go with a new guy and kind of have everybody grow together. But Vancouver and Pittsburgh. Vancouver needs to kind of win now. I'm not saying Vancouver has to win the Cup, but I think Vancouver – Just expectations from the city and the fans, which is a lot of pressure up north of the border. I think that they need to make the playoffs. Yeah, they do. I mean, they were in the Stanley Cup three years ago, and they almost won it. And you might be able to roll the dice and get a young, strong minor league or even a collegiate coach to get you there. I don't think that's the type of city to put a young, unproven coach in. There's just way too many pressures on the outside, never mind on the ice, in a city like Vancouver. My thought on, on Ditto this, in Pittsburgh. Well, there is a similarity there, and nothing against Vancouver, but the way they've run their team the last couple of years has kind of been in eight different directions. But the coach, You don't want to be like that. But who's, the, who's, who's on the front line dealing with the media questions every day about what a club does? The coach. The coach, right? You don't you see the media in front of the general manager every day. You don't see the media in front of the owner every day. But you do see the media in front of the coach every day and the coach and the players. So if you've got a young, unproven coach in a room that's dealing with, and you just said it, Vancouver's kind of made some weird decisions over the last couple of seasons. Those questions are still going to come. Now you've got a young coach that's got to answer them. You've still got the locker room that still has to answer those questions. I would on have a daily to, basis. I would have to take a look back, and that would be extensive research, which I didn't do. I don't think anybody's done, actually. I, I, don't, I don't know this yet, but I can't remember the last time a team switched a coach and a GM and then won the Stanley Cup the next season. Vancouver, at least the fans and the media up there, the expectation is winning the Cup. I think that's a little unrealistic, but I talked about this a month ago. Yeah, you need a goalie. But that's true. Pittsburgh has Sidney Crosby, and they have Evgeny Malkin, and I think any impartial And a whole observer, bunch of other talented that's players. That's true. Brought in by Ray Shiro. You get those guys, I think any impartial hockey observer will tell you they're two of the top five players in the world. Mm -hmm. You have to be going to Stanley Cups. And now you've just fired your coach and your GM. Jim Rutherford, well-respected throughout the league. Correct. Not not a bad choice. I would not have He has a Stanley Cup ring. He does, with Carolina. I would not have gotten rid of Ray Shiro. But either way, my rule is you don't fire your coach unless you have a better option in mind. Who's the better option? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Because I don't know who that option is. Like Vancouver, I understand it wasn't working with Tortorella. They're in a tough spot. They're still waiting. Maybe they'll take Bilesma. I mean, every team has apparently expressed interest. I'm looking at this. Carolina, I think the best fit is Ulf Samuelson. 
Florida. Well, we discussed that last week. Yeah. But Dan Bilesman makes a lot of sense for Florida and Vancouver and Pittsburgh. He's the best <laughs> option out there. And Vancouver's got a lot of other decisions to make, too. And when I touched on it, and maybe one, one day we'll sit and look at it a little deeper because you've got, uh, you got the Sedin twins who are not the Sedin twins of old. And then you have a guy, um, what's his name? Uh, Ryan Kessler. Yeah, well, Ryan Kessler is a player that could be on the move this summer. And just kind of reading the tea leaves. I've never used that phrase before. I feel so British. A lot of the GMs are kind of hinting that there's going to be a lot of movement this summer. Look, July 1st hits. There's always a lot of free agency. There's nine hours of television programming on TSN about free agency. But it sounds like we may see some trades and some big trades this summer. And it's not just coming from one or two coaches, or GMs rather. We're hearing it from a lot of different sources. And so you get the feeling if one big domino falls, a lot are going to fall. And Ryan Kessler could be one of the biggest. Doug, I hear you've acquired a top ten list. Maybe this should be a Well, segment. you know, I'm an avid Twitter or, individual. Okay. And a, um, I see uh, YMI past my eyes, and it was the Hockey News. And the Hockey News um, put a list of the, what they feel would be kind of the the top 10 off-season trades or possible trades, guys that are being talked about being traded. Kessler was number one on their list. So I don't have the list in front of me. Are you going to throw the 10 out, and I'm going to give you one word, the first word that well, pops in my mind? what do mind? you think? I mean, do you think Ryan Kessler at Vancouver would move him? Or do you think Vancouver should move the Sedin Twins? Or... Do you want to lose a center of Kessler's caliber? I don't, but I think they could get a lot, and I do think they were close to moving him at the trade deadline, and he wants out. Yeah, he said he's wanted a trade. Yeah. So, I mean, he probably will be moved, so that's probably why the Hockey News picked him number one. And he could be a, a, a huge – I mean, he could be a game changer. He makes $5 million next year, $5 million the year after. So if you trade for him, you're getting a guy at a fairly decent price, considering what he's done, for two more years. You're not renting a player – at the trade deadline. No. So, so Vancouver can expect quite a bit back. And that I tell you what, you know, Jim Benning has been the GM there for a week, basically, and he's going to step in, and that's a big move to start off your, your GM career. Right. And then number two on the hockey news list was uh, Jason Spezza up in Ottawa. That one's I, – I don't think that's nearly as inevitable as Kessler. I think Kessler's going to happen. I think that the Spezza thing's probably not as inevitable because of the cap hit he brings. Yeah, what are you accomplishing if you are Ottawa by doing that? Uh, moving $7 million. Yeah, okay. But, I mean, you're you're expecting to make the playoffs, right? I know you didn't this year. But if you're moving him, is it just a salary dump, or are you trying to bring in some depends, decent young pieces? Depends on what you can get for him, I guess. Are you bringing in guys you expect to help now? Because you've got... Eric Carlson, you've got, I mean, you've got you've got pieces there. You got Bobby Ryan. You've He's got also one of those guys too, though. I think that you know it's a cliche, but I think he needs a new environment. I don't know. I I don't, I don't I think like he's he lived up. Ottawa. I don't think he's lived up to the potential. Well, if you remember, I mean, he was one of those guys that you, know, you heard about him when he was thirteen years old. Mm -hmm. I, I I go back to all the years I followed hockey. I knew about. Spezza before he was basically even before he was playing junior. I knew about Crosby and I knew about Lindros. Those are really the only guys I knew about before they were even playing junior hockey. And Connor McDavid. But I mean, he hasn't even really gotten going yet. No. But yeah, Spezza. So in that regard, I mean, he's not one of the best ever, but he's been good. Okay. Number three. I love this one. Wait, do you think he gets traded or not? No, I think he stays. Okay. Uh, number three on the list is, um, again, this is the hockey news put this list together. And I just thought it was interesting, so we're going over it. The number one overall pick, who owns it, is the Florida Panthers. What do you think about that? I feel like they're open to, you know, if some great deal comes along, but I, I'm not dealing that. If I, I think Dave Talon's a smart, smart man, oh, and yeah. if some beautiful deal comes along, he would gladly give up the pick. But it's got to be a special deal. Well, you know, there was talk of Calgary wanting to move up to number one. And, you know, we'll get more into this draft. But what's Calgary going to give up? The number four pick. And then I don't know what else. But we'll get more into this draft. I don't think they got much. In a week or two. <laughs> that's, and anything they have that's young, they want to keep. Because they're trying they to They got Brad Tree living. Uh, yeah, and he's a... He's, you know, Here, you're going to have me? 
Now, I would make that trade if I was Florida. If I got Trey Lamoy, but you got to give up talent. Nah, it's so complicated. Uh, we'll get into the draft more in a future show, but there's essentially four top players, and they kind of go in different order depending on where you're looking, but it's those four guys. So if you have pick four, is it really worth trading to move up to pick one? Yeah, and – Again, like I said, I think that uh, Mr. Talon's a very smart man, and it's going to have to be a special deal to give up a number one pick. Well, if if I'm him, if I can get the fourth pick and still get one of those top four and a good young player that could help me, I'd be interested. But as it is, I think they probably just keep it and take Aaron Ekblad because they passed on a stud defenseman last year, and they got a good player up front in Alexander Barkov, but now they can get Ekblad too. So we'll see. Well, speaking of Calgary, but now in Toronto, number four is Dion Phaneuf. Yeah, I, I never try to make sense of what Toronto's doing. I, I'll leave this one up to you. I'm not a Phaneuf fan, so if they trade him, I'm happy. Phaneuf's <laughs> enough. Phaneuf's enough, yeah. He's making a lot of money. I think you're going to have a hard time trading him. He's being paid $7 million a year through 2021. And I think he's a good player, but man, that's a lot of money tied up. Yeah, they just signed him, right? Yes, this past season they signed him. They found some way. We were thinking like they can't sign Kessel and Phaneuf, and, I mean, they had the Kadri thing, too, and who knows if he's going to be... They haven't really decided what they're doing with him. I don't know how they've managed to find enough money to sign Phaneuf seven years, $7 million. Well, I remember watching 24-7. He was a happy guy. Because he just made $49 million. And I'm like, wow. You know, and like I said, I'm not a, a Phaneuf fan. I'm a, a Maple Leaf fan, but I'm not a Phaneuf fan. Um, I don't know. I mean, who are they going to get? For the money he just signed for. If you trade him, you also send... It's like you're not... If you trade Dion Phaneuf, you're not getting a 28-year-old defenseman. No. I think partially if they do it, they're going to... Somewhere in the back of their mind, whether they admit it or not, it's kind of to get rid of that contract, too, which they did just sign. I mean... That's kind of weird. They're not going to dump him for nothing. Who knows? That might not even happen. But, you know, if you could get a good player back and get rid of some of that salary. But again, if you get rid of him, you also get rid of Alicia Cuthbert. She goes with him. So if she leaves Toronto, oh. you got to factor that in. Yeah, I guess. Trade him to L.A. That would make sense. Or Anna. Oh, yeah. It's number five. Who did we th- did we start at number one? Yeah, who do you think's at number five? I mean, this is not how you do a top ten list. You start at ten, you work your way uh, up. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Who do I think is at number five? Yeah. How am I supposed to come up with what <laughs> trades the Hockey News put at number five? Sam Garnier. Well, I should have guessed him because he's, uh, he's in trade rumors every month. Every month, yeah. So. But... I don't think – I think that is a strong possibility only because I think the Oilers have enough talent that if they gave up – Especially up front. If they gave up Gagne, yeah, they're really not – depends on what they get back for him. If they could trade him for an established defenseman, you know, let's start just – Established staring, defenseman or Dion goaltender. Phaneuf. Trade him for Dion Phaneuf. We knock out number four and five right there. Yeah, I guess. And they got Victor Faust. Maybe he's your goalie. Hmm. I keep thinking Edmonton's going to turn. You know, the I said he wasn't twenty eight; he's twenty nine. See, liar! It's unacceptable behavior on this podcast. Oh my goodness! Um, Donnie gets traded. Go ahead. Okay, Mike Green. I don't know what happened to him. I was a big fan of Mike Green. He was really good for a while, and he's kind of. I don't know. Appeared in the sunset. I don't know if it's injuries or what the deal is, but when they. When they signed him to his current contract, it was based on what he had done up until that point. And yeah. I don't know that you're going to be able to trade him. You know, if you're Washington, I'm sure he's a fan favorite there, too. I mean, when you get any sort of blue liner that can also produce that much offense, you don't want to give him up. But he's not the same player he was. And he's not old. Uh, no. and I don't know. I think he stays. Number seven. He's only got one more year on the deal. Okay. Number seven. Joe Thornton. This is the most interesting one, I think. Yeah, because there's um, San Jose fizzled out first round. Kept their GM. And their coach. Kept their coach. And every player so far. Well, except Dan Boyle. So what does San Jose have to do to change chemistry and get things going in Northern California. Well, they have to either not play L.A. in the playoffs. <laughs> That's a good start. Or they're going to have to make some sort of move to shake things up. If you trade Joe Thornton, that shakes everything up. That's a Hall of Famer that's your captain. 
Yeah, I mean, you're you're not just messing with trading a player. You're messing with the whole chemistry of the room. Yeah, you better you better you know. better make sure you know what you're doing before you make that decision. That's like mixing some sort of chemical compound that I don't know that's dangerous. You I, I think that the the powers that be in San Jose would be better off just keeping Joe right where he is and trying to figure out another way of approaching the season, whether it's a new coaching philosophy, whether it's a new organizational philosophy. But I've also, uh, you know, f- from people I talk to, um, they've made some moves internally too at, over in San Jose. Yeah. So they're not resting but yeah, no, I, I just nobody ever does. I think moving Joe, Th- Joe Thornton would be a mistake. Well, it comes down to your team philosophy. I mean, you hear all these guys talk about how within a specific game, you just want to put you want to if you're if you're not scoring, you want to at least be getting chances. Mm-hmm. If you're in a game, you just want to be in a position to have a chance to win in the third period. If you are talking the whole season, you want to be good during the regular season, good enough to put yourself in position to have success in the playoffs. San Jose does all those things. They just have not had success in the playoffs to the point that you would expect. I mean, right. they've, they've made the conference finals before. Joe Thornton's the highest paid player on the team. I just go back to earlier this season when you know they didn't have Marlowe signed, they didn't have Thornton signed, they were trying to work out money for Couture and Pavelski, and they, you know, they got them signed last season. But either way, you and I marveled at the fact that they were able to get all four of those guys signed and add Thomas Hurdle through the draft mm-hmm. and how just how set they were going forward. And now all of a sudden... You know, your top defenseman is Mark Edward Vlasic. You don't have much Pickle. else. Pickles. It's his nickname. Okay. You, you've got you've got Pickles and you've got a few forwards. I mean, if you can trade Thornton and get a lot, maybe you do it. Uh, I don't know. I just think it would be a mistake. I feel like Toronto. I'm a chemistry would, guy. You need that chemistry. Toronto seems like the team that would give up a lot for him. Great. And they're on the top of the list, actually. There's uh-huh. a list of six teams that are apparently really interested. Great. They're interested in everybody except their own players. Go ahead. Brad Marshall. That one's surprising to me. I don't know if his uh, his antics have worn thin in Boston. I know that they were a little frustrated with some of the penalties he took in the series against Montreal. He had 53 points this season. Well, yeah. He produces. Of, you, well, he's one of the main reasons they won the Stanley Cup a couple of years ago, too. If you're trading him, you expect to get quite a bit back because that's that's a young player, too. Right. And he's got... Three years left on his deal, four point five million a year. I think he only gets dealt if somebody really makes them a real nice offer. I don't think they're actively shopping him. James Reimer. I feel bad for this guy. Yeah, he probably just wants out at this point. Right? I would think so. I mean, he proves his worth. He gets called up from the AHL. He proves his worth in Toronto. They bring in Mr. Schneider. No, Bernier. Uh, no, Bernier. They were going to bring in not Schneider. Schneider or Bernier. Excuse me. My bad. And I remember when Bernier was sent to Toronto, I was like, I was pretty happy because yeah. I liked them, right? Huh. Then all we get all season long is this number one, no, not number one, number one, no, not number one, number one, no, not number one, all the way through the season. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So I think James just wants to go somewhere, be a number one goalie, and prove to everybody that he deserves it. Have you looked at, at Toronto, just what's going to happen to them? Coming up, like Dave Boland's a UFA, Nikolai Kuhleman, Jay McClement, Mason Raymond, who had a decent year, Troy Bodie, Paul Ranger, Jake Gardner, Cody Franz, and those guys are all free agents. Some of them are restricted. But, I mean, your team that's as far as locked in going forward is basically Kessel, Lupel, <clears throat> Phaneuf, David Clarkson, James Van Riemsdyk. And I heard they wanted to trade him, too. I'm sure they do. They paid him a lot of money to get, sit around and get suspended. Nazem Kadri, who is good, but they might want to trade him too. It sounds like so. I don't. That's your problem. You deal with them. I got to deal with. Okay, team and the last one, uh, the Hockey News top ten, which is not really a top ten. Uh, they refer to it top ten offseason trade candidates. Hypothetical is, top is ten. The name, yes, hypothetical top ten is Evander. Okay, yeah. There's. What just, do you think? I think that happens. I think if this is what I think goes on there. If trades do start happening this summer, and and it is kind of the way people are forecasting it might play out, I think Kane gets traded because he's been productive up there, but it's weird because we don't live in Winnipeg, obviously. Right. But it does seem like there's kind of a love-hate relationship between him and that city, and it's always been that way. Even when he's been really good, they it seems like if he does anything, he's never gotten in trouble. 
no. off the ice. But if he does anything people don't approve of, they're like, yeah, get him out of here. And it's kind of going back and forth. He's a good player. There's a lot of teams that would like Evander Kane. I personally like the way he plays. I do too. Um, he only played 63, 63 games last year. Yeah, it was a little bit of a down year for him. But he's still 63 games. He had 41 points. It's not bad. No. And in the shortened season, the 48-game season, played all 48, he had 33 points. And I'll even I'll go this far. If you're Winnipeg and you're trying to make the playoffs in the Western Conference, I think you need a guy like Evander Kane. He's 20, 27 he's, years old, big, can hit, and score. Right. I mean, that's what you need. Exactly what you need. He's basically what Especially LA— Especially in the Western Conference if you're going up a team like L.A. And they just switched to the West last year, so maybe they haven't grasped that yet because they haven't seen him at his best. But, yeah— he he's basically what LA has twelve of. Do I do I have to show you stats? I mean, I mean, like, just look at the numbers in the East and look at the numbers in the West. Clearly, the West is the tougher conference. Well, if uh, LA wins one more game, it'll be six of eight Stanley Cups to the West. Six of the last eight will have gone to the West. So there you go. All right, final uh, topic here. Do we have anything else? Sam Bennett can't do any pull-ups. That story has like swept the nation. <laughs> Who cares? Who cares? I mean, he cares. He came out yesterday and said that it does bother him that everybody's essentially just picking on him because he can't do any pull-ups at the Combine. Can he skate? Uh, He seems pretty good at scoring goals. Yeah, and can he score? Yeah. You know what? We can get to the pull-ups later. I don't feel like pull-ups decide the Stanley Cup. How old is Sam? 18? 18. 17 or 18? How many pull-ups can you do? Me? Yeah. Uh, not very many. No, the other guy in the room. No, not very many. Pull-ups are not easy. Now, myself, I can obviously do 150 at a time, one-armed, if I need to. I can do two different pull-ups at the same time. But He's 17, dude. Okay. 17. He's got a long way to go. The video of him trying to do the pull-ups, first of all, that is the most empty feeling. I remember in high school, I couldn't do pull-ups. Nobody could. It was always just a really short kid who somehow had giant arms. He do you do know the what they have now? Especially for guys that are a little heavier than other guys. No. They have rubber bands. So you put your knee or something in a rubber band, and the rubber band helps you pull up your weight. It, it compensates. That's cheating. It's so that you can build arm strength, and then you get rid of the band. There's different levels of bands to help you do that so that you can get into it, and then eventually you get rid of the band, and it's just you. Well, the video of him trying to do a pull-up with everybody watching just brought back flashbacks to junior high when I couldn't do pull because we had to do that stupid president's test the fitness test oh yeah pretty fit I hated do a it. single pull up we had to climb the rope did you have to do that yeah and that's really come in handy a lot in my life too let me tell you I climb ropes every day <laughs> that's how I get to work I'm basically Tarzan I don't know why that was ever a thing it's like they decided just the most as if like teaching us trigonometry we'd never use wasn't a, enough of a waste of time. They decided, let's find physical things that they'll never do I think do the either. president back there was fans with Jack Elaine. Oh, well, you there know, you go. Let's do jumping jacks and sit-ups and, and pull-ups. Yeah, well, I think it's hooey. Sam will be just fine. I'd take you back to the NBA draft a couple of years ago when Kevin Durant couldn't bench press as much as they wanted, and now he's the second best player in the world. If I sign Sam Bennett to my team and he scores 80 points a, a season for me and only does one pull-up, done deal. I think he needs to score and after his first goal, do a pull-up on the crossbar. That's what he needs to do. I should be his agent. That'd be hilarious. That would be awesome. He, um, it's, he's going to be fine. He's one of those top four guys we'll get into in the future here. That is it for episode 43. Join us next week as we put a bow on the 2013-14 season and take a look ahead to the upcoming NHL draft. We'll also put a bow on the 2013-2014 AHL season and possible coaching decisions around the league. Plus, whatever else happens in the next seven days, thanks for listening to the Hockey Podcast.